Hi, I'm CJ Newbern, and for the compute software part of NVIDIA, I drive a lot of what we do for HPC. I'm really passionate about this topic of HPC and AI at the edge. I'd like to share a little bit about uh, some orchestration aspects of that. So uh, data, lots of data. In the old days, we used to manufacture data from simulations that were started with a bit of ab initio data. Now we collect vast amounts of data from our environment. What do we do with it? We format it, signal process it, compress it, reconstruct it, filter it, apply inference data, and we ship these valuable insights back for further processing on a supercomputer. So it might be 20 terabytes a night from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, 10x that per day from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, or 16 terabytes per second from the Square Kilometer Array. The next few years, predicting 10x that for the CERN LHC or 100x those uh, sizes or rates from the square kilometer array. This lets us do new science, things we just couldn't do before. So what is HPC and AI at the edge? Some people say HPC is defined as scaling up and scaling out with discipline. And the AI is uh, training and inference for models. You can have all kinds of different data input. You can control a variety of different things. The things that I think are most exciting are where you have a hybrid of those, where you can start an experimental setup and you say, oh man, the, the camera was out of focus. We need to calibrate things. Um, let's not collect a bunch of bad data and then send it back and you know, three months later find out we are messed up. Uh, or uh, let's not sort of under collect the samples when there's anomalous behavior going on and have them say, no, no, redo the experiment because that looks really interesting. Go focus on that. If you have a model, you're basically transferring the scientist's brain straight into the loop and so that you can learn as you go. An extreme example of this, uh, some, I visited some guys at RNL's manufacturing demonstration facility where they actually uh, are doing 3D printing. They're adapting to any changes that there might be in environmental conditions, and they're at, at literally with every part they make, they learn how to make the next part better. Really cool stuff. So you have lots of IoT sensors, all this coming in, your A recommendations going back. You may want a server that's right near those instruments or at the base tower of uh, base of the 5G tower. And you may not always be connected to the cloud, uh, could be lower bandwidth, could be intermittent, but still with the cloud, you need to authenticate, deploy, monitor, scale, manage, lots of fun things that you need to do. And you can imagine that it'd be crazy to have an IT guy out at all the places where you're collecting data. Models, pretty valuable, kind of want some security around those. And uh, where you're interacting with the cloud at the edge, you have to be always on have to be reliable and yeah, have to be resilient even over the air. So what is it that you have that you could bring to bear? Well, there are lots of places with repositories, with containers, with trained models and ways to deploy them like through Helm charts. I've got lots of SDKs in the industry to be able to work with this and lots of different kinds of um, platforms that you can work on. Uh, wanting to accelerate this, you can build faster and deploy anywhere. Um, so an example of this is the NVIDIA GPU cloud uh, that others have referred to here. So now we want to say, well, what can we do for the edge? So you may start with a server here um, where uh, sort of working from the bottom, you want to make sure that you have a server that's validated um, as performant with everything you need. Um, you have the security via a trusted platform model or TPM. You have an EGX stack. Uh, uh, like uh, something like this, uh, ours, uh, it's what we call ours, uh, the NVIDIA's cloud native software stack. Um, it's robust and resilient and secure, um, works with things like Red Hat OpenShift, and then uh, a bunch of different application frameworks on top of that, um, and that have the application containers, modules, model scripts, Helm charts, and so on, uh, for things like smart cities and healthcare, and robotics, um, where you can have robots sort of learn as you go, um, and uh, Arial for Telco. Um, all this integrated into NGC, or you can have third-party ISVs that are built on top of this as well. So uh, the key notion here is that you want to be able to orchestrate from the cloud, do it securely with automation so that you can really scale up. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, again, there's, there's no way you could have an IT guy at all of your stores, at 
all your factories at 12 billion acres. I think that's 1.3x the area of the moon. Um, or 10 trillion miles uh, that are driven in people's cars or call centers or whatever. It'd be, it'd be just crazy. So I'm going to talk some about GPU operators. Uh, before that, we're going to get to uh, looking at sort of what's Kubernetes good at um, and why use Helm. Kubernetes out of the box will schedule an application on a worker node that makes sure that it fulfills your requirements. You need two GPUs? Yep, check. Make sure that it runs on that. It's also self-healing. It'll restart applications on a different node if the current node went down for any reason, and it'll maintain the replicas you need for high availability. Hem charts can be used to configure and deploy and update multi-container apps in a single step, and you're kind of templated for uh, per-deployment configuration. So um, those are some things you can do. Um, let's double-click into this. So uh, a key thing, uh, hearkening back to the uh, talk uh, earlier on devices, the previous session, uh, you want to make use of Kubernetes device plugins to, for example, expose the number of devices uh, and track their health in each cluster and to be able to run device-enabled containers. Um, make sure that you have all the components that you need, uh, for example, a driver, a runtime, device plugin, and monitoring. Uh, you want to run those on top of Kubernetes, and we'll show a little bit why. Uh, there's some blogs that have been written around this that are pretty helpful, some from NVIDIA, some from Red Hat, and there's a repo that you can go. This is all open source. And uh, these operators are built as new custom resource definitions. Um, and the CRDs basically uh, is a language that can describe a state machine uh, that tells you how to bring everything up and maintain it if it goes down and uh, interoperate with these different components that you need. And as we'll see, the Kubernetes node feature discovery uh, is really important in figuring out uh, where and how to make this all work together. So let's, I, I don't have a thousand words, uh, but I'll use just a few pictures. In the old days, you started with a Linux distribution, but then you had to kind of mess around with some things uh, at, and the way that things were installed locally uh, with your Linux driver. Um, we made that better with the Kubernetes device plugin model. Um, where you could have the runtime and communities, and it would, uh, you know, have the, the plugins and the monitoring running on top of that. Um, but a key trend is actually uh, to be able to make it so that uh, you never mess with uh, what's going on in the OS, um, and that you can uh, essentially install all the con uh, components that you need, like those four that are shown, uh, and run them as Kubernetes services. And this allows you to have a single image for all the CPU and GPU nodes. And so these operators simplify all the operational aspects of managing clusters um, so that you can do it at the cluster level instead of the per host level. So let's look at how this works. On, the, on day one, um, you're going to use the node feature discovery or NFD um, is implemented in the daemon set um, to detect all the hardware features and install uh, everything you need um, and install the plugin. As a second step, uh, you go and start and, uh, installing the components you need, like the container runtime and the driver. You can validate that all of those components work with just a local run of a Kubernetes sample, for example, without any use of Kubernetes. <clears throat> and then you can set up um, the data center monitoring service and the Kubernetes device plugin, and then uh, run this in the context of the plugin uh, as you know, sort of orchestrated via Kubernetes. And so this will greatly so, uh, simplify your day zero operation. So um, on some later day, when uh, along comes a new node, uh, you can essentially just say, ah, yep, got GPUs in it. I'll call the GPU operator and automatically install everything you need to. Uh, no human interaction required. So uh, the uh, standard stacks here for Kubernetes and OpenShift, uh, including for ARM, for our EGX Jetson uh, that's there. And uh, just to pick a particular example, suppose you have uh, 5G data that's coming in um, and it's in the uh, virtualized radio access network um, or that's coming in through the intelligent video analytics. Um, maybe this is all combined in the multi-access edge computing so that you can enable the cloud computing capabilities. Um, maybe you're working with DeepStream here for the vision AI because uh, you're dealing with science instruments or your retail or construction or manufacturing or some of these other examples. Essentially, you have these 
uh, value add SDKs that are running on top of uh, standard infrastructure with Kubernetes and, and key hardware that you need. Under. A lot of us are concerned about health right now. And so uh, I'd like to kind of highlight uh, something that you can do here where you're securely authenticating all these clients, uh, where you can take data and sort of depersonalize it and locally train on the private data and then securely share the partial model weights and federate this into something. Uh, so you get pretty good results with the medium model looking in the upper right um, and more, larger models will help, but it's actually much better if you federate things. So each individual node gets a model from the server, runs a training iteration, updates the model and pushes those updates back to the server, um, yielding a higher quality uh, federated model result. And this is kind of one of the things we're doing and uh, Clara for COVID, uh, our company's doing a lot of other investments in COVID right now. So pretty cool stuff to see this come together. So a call to action out of this would be to evaluate an edge system, um, whether it's OpenShift, maybe it's NGC ready platforms uh, with this EGX stack we've been talking about. Carefully consider the requirements that you need for those distributed systems and evaluate and apply them, and then help identify any remaining gaps, help bridge them. Uh, we've asked that this be uh, queued up in the HPC Containers of Boundary Council. Uh, again, this is a place where we're identifying some of the key technical challenges and working together to resolve them. We invite you to participate in that. Um, just drop me an email. Happy to be in touch and enjoy the rest of the show.